of quantum events. Okay, if we miss the point of that, I, the, obviously this is trying to be made simple. It is complicated subject matter, um, but it's actually quite simple. Essentially what they're saying is, is that the act of observation collapses a wave potentiality which makes a situation an event or a object even, in some cases with acute um, ability applied to this, become physical. Okay? And this is the basis of what quantum physics and theory has always been about. And this is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is not some new age mumbo jumbo. This is coming from the best minds on earth. And you look up and see who Heisenberg is. And so this is very interesting that they know this, and this is directly relevant to the technology which has been used since this time. And this is a, you know, we see that this is, you know, all the way back to 1930. So this is actually the first picture released this year um, of light behaving as both a particle and a wave. And it's a really cool picture. Anybody can do a little bit of research on that as well. And this is interesting because we see the act of observation shifting there to illustrate it as both um, matter, uh, matter and a wave. And so the implications of this idea on our physical reality are profound and are, you know, there's so many different potentialities. That's what's so interesting. We have what's called eigenstates that are propagated as waveform. And this is wave potential. And so what we know is, is that when we, when we observe waves, we have a change in the physical environment that is expressed tangibly for us in very different, many different ways. Um, and so when they are, we have an artificial intelligence, which we've seen, they're propagating, it's it, this AI is propagating the wavelengths um, from the towers and the smart grid, etc., and then the, the collapse of the quantum wave function inherent to human observation is then playing out the potentiality of an artificial nature. And this is like the ultimate coupling of man and machine. And it's, it, this is the state of agenda with the cybernetics and so on. And so it's, it's pretty simple when we begin to understand the, the, the Emoto experiments or placebo experiments in which there are innumerable studies in which we see things changing in our physical environment based on the, our intention and things that we have in it. But when we have an artificial stimulus in the environment that is seeding the environment with artificial waveform and we have the collapse of the quantum wave function inherent to our own observation at that point, we have participated in the generation of artificial timelines in a real sense because these things are coming out there and it's our perception that makes timelines what they are. I mean, this is the basis of general and special relativity in that time is constrained by the velocity of C, which is 186,000 miles a second, and mass also distorts space-time, and thoughts, therefore also having mass, will distort space-time. And So when they concede you essentially with fake thoughts, it's having a... a a manifesto result in, in the environment. And this brings us to a set of documents which this is classified, um, had been classified by a, a particular band of satanic um, professors, intelligence officials, individuals throughout the defense and intelligence community as well as um, academia um, and many different universities. And again, we see that at the beginning, all the way back to 1930, they chose to classify this information within academia and put a new type of teaching to, in effect, we saw that at the, in the beginning of the presentation here. Um, this says modeling in an artificial universe at the top. Um, this is one of the color-coded documents. This is from DARPA back in 1997, as you see down here. Um, not so long ago, electronic systems were literal expressions of the electromechanics within. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you. That means before, transhumanism had been something that had already happened. This is a historical context in which we draw, and they knew that they were essentially reactivating this system, and they did it intentionally when they did it. And this gets back into the Tower of Babel and all these different things, which are a complete part of this PowerPoint demonstration that they put together. I initially, you know, BCI'd this off the internet. This is the system called Towers of Abstraction, in which we see Montauk-type technology refined and incorporated into the global communications infrastructure and used with artificial intelligence to control not only human thought processes and emotion, but to literally steal the creative ability to have a negative manifestation. And that is something that is very difficult to wrap the mind around, I think, in, in initially for some people. And it's a lot to look at, 
but it tells you what these guys are doing, and we see this going on around us, and so we'll get into that more. But the, today, layers of abstraction hide electromechanics, uh, which were within, take it into context. Not so long ago, electronic systems were literal expressions of electronic mechanic, or electromechanics within. Today, they hide it, and they design with metaphors. Effective management of complexity will depend on choosing the right mix of metaphors. And that gets into the cloud interface, and we know what they have that's hooked up to even CERN has what's called an eigenmode generator. And what that means is, is it's, it's generating waveform that can be perceived by the human organism that is artificial, and it's like, it's like a, it's a wave potentiality that makes physical um, situations able to be something that we can experience. And so this is really virtual reality on a level that is so complicated. It literally is the matrix at this point. Um, and what is the cloud? You know, we have the swarm at the edge of the cloud. All this stuff is stemming from Berkeley. UC Berkeley, which we can trace many of the things with Margellans back to there. The Genome Research Lab had the audacity to basically engrave their initials with nanolithography into these different, um, you know, the Morgellons uh, artifacts, the different crystalline structures and so on. And we see that they have signed their name on this work as well as NASA. And the swarm at the edge of the cloud is the integration of, of man and machine. It's transhumanism. And this is from their documents. Um, the swarm gives the cloud ears, eyes, hands, and feet, enabling services that are directly embedded in the physical world rather than just in the cyber world. Making the platform open and universal will unleash millions of swarm devices and swarmlet developers just as smartphone platforms open the door to millions of app developers. And this is really an element of compartmentalization that has been very prominent in, in, in order to allow this NSA spying that has just gotten shut down to put this conference in context. We have just had the NSA lapse in spying. Um, the USA Freedom Act was then um, signed after that. There's a lot of conjecture about if this is good or bad. The bottom line is it really all has to do with this system and it being shut off. It would trace it back to 1996. Um, and the cloud. What is the cloud? This is an artificial intelligence-based data center um, for uh, IBM. This is um, the you know, data centers. Of the cloud is a place on Earth, and it talks about the development of these different things and gets into it. And this is the, the advancements made in artificial intelligence with IBM is something that it's not really a matter of conjecture. They've had this for a long time, and we do see that. Um, and what do we have here? We have a refined Montauk device. We saw how the stuff works. We have all the documents. And what they're doing at this school, this is the largest elementary school in the Dallas Independent School District, um, in which it has a largely um, minority student body. It's predominantly Hispanic. And I have been out there, I have passed out flyers to these kids, the crossing guard, the teachers, the cops, the feds I have talked to about this. You name the frickin' agency, NSA, FBI, CIA, Director of National Intelligence, President, all kinds of crap. I have been in these people's face with this. And what are we looking at? They indoctrinate children inside this place the same way they did at Montauk. It's the same thing. This school is called Anne Frank. Now, if anybody knows what Anne Frank is, the story, it's just it's surreal. This type of propaganda makes the leaflets that were dropped in the ghetto look like freaking Christmas cards compared to what is really going on. And what they're doing, they're, just notice the location of this, in which this is not, unfortunately, a, a fluke. We see the placement of these devices, which are Class B carcinogens, there is literally a radio frequency exposure warning sign on the other side of that on the basketball court. You can see the basketball goal there, right around there on that tower. There's a sign that says you should not be here. Radio frequency exposure warning sign. And my response is mind control is, is dismissed due to its effectiveness. That means that this stuff works so good that when you look at it in the face, a cop will write you a ticket out in the parking lot, but he doesn't care that there's a federal law violation going on in the freaking park on the playground, okay? With these children running out underneath it. And so this is something that is massive and major. It's a refined Nazi type of of technology. And how do they like to hide it? They like to they like to hide it in plain view. 
we do see the incorporation of this is a highly subliminal this is a highly subjective subliminal environment okay and they use the kids this way in order to have the manifested result that they tune them to and beyond any of that the neural pathways of children are at this developmental age um, in, we know that DNA is a fractal antenna and electromagnetic field, and so does the FCC and other organizations. And this means many different things. It's expressed on many different levels. But the bottom line is we know that the neural pathways are being reworked in children to a specific form of pathway routing in the human body due to this electromagnetic thing. And another part of this is the electroporation in which... They essentially electrify the air in order to deliver DNA and, and pharmaceuticals into the human cell. And so I don't have a slide for that here, but it is a part of that. And so we get into the cloud system. This is back to the complex systems that comes out of Berkeley. And this is the analogous imagery and semantics. You have timing, structure, control laws, logic. You have different images. These are the eigenstates that are represented from the eigenmode generator. And this is wave potentiality of an artificial nature that is coming from the cloud. This is how this document is classified, and this is exactly what that's going on. And it is right at the cutting edge of not only physics, but quantum physics, and even plasma theory is incorporated into this in the sense that when the melding of this happens with the collapse of the quantum wave function, it does bring something physical into existence. Um, and that is what the whole Montauk project and all these other things, of course, have been about. And so when we look at these documents, it really makes us want to know if we have researched any of these projects. This is what they're doing. We get into the different ways that time is affected, uh, uh, affected rather. And you have the system, and everybody is plugged into this cloud through the interfacing of the EEG type of technology in the devices themselves. And so I can provide the, the, the solicitations from DARPA and such from this. And so it just shows the different interactions. And this is something that is of such magnitude at a level of classification. It's very difficult. You have the different shapes there. You know, I don't know what you guys want to call that. Maybe it's the flying fruit. That almost looks like a turtle to me upside down. This looks almost like that'll fit in there. Do you see how that fits? Mm -hmm. And this is the way that people think. Okay, it's the collapse of the quantum wave function from an artificial stimulus to make something happen. Okay, um, shift in perspective can reduce the complexity of an image. Um, and this is all about the focus and everything. And you want to talk about you know thinking outside the box. Um, you have this framework. Is an explicit explicit representation that enforces constraints on variable interrelationships, okay? Put this into context for yourself. It's a little difficult if we don't have a math or these other ways of thinking, but a simple way to think about this is that light is constrained by velocity of C. You have waves coming in, and they, they only generate the ones that they want you to think about. And then you begin to think about them, and the shit becomes real, okay? That's, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And so we do see satanic reference here we do see you know Nimrod this is the Tower of Babel this is the beginning opening from Edward Lee we can tie him in I'm just going to tell you after I pulled this document it implicated them in child trafficking it implicated them in many other things we went public with this different agencies were notified and so on um, we had over a thousand arrests in Operation Archimedes um, within a very short amount of time after this information became made available to the proper authorities. And it's nice to see them act on that, although it is, has still been frustrating to see this system fight us every tooth and nail all of the way. I mean, that's what we've been dealing with. And if you don't know your history, which is part of this analogous imagery and semantics of being able to decipher this document, <coughs> Nimrod was the established, he established the kingdom of Babylon. He was the great grandson of Noah, and he built the Tower of Babel, in which God said no. You can't get this close to me, whether you're using it for the wrong reasons, whatever. Cast us down, made us speak different languages, and we're coming back from this today now, um, in my opinion. And I think that that's very interesting in that he is essentially the granddaddy of the sons of disobedience from a scriptural context, and he's considered to be a very evil person um, in the Bible. And certainly he is kind of a, uh, a hallmark of satanic worship. And so then we get into what Babel is today in the computer-related terms in the context of which we're talking about. Um, it's a glossary of computer-oriented abbreviations and acronyms that you can really trace back quite far. It is interesting, the 1996 here, we do trace a lot of things back to that date. But the different acronyms, whether for military, for uh, programming, and so on, is called Babel. Um, and it is a writing language that interacts with human consciousness. 
Um, this gets us into the Nimrod routing architecture, which is literally what they call it. This is from 1996 also. And we do have the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that does mandate a set of criteria, all of which had to be met directly following the attacks of September 11th and 2001. Um, and so that's another hallmark of this different quantum access and things technology. Um, and we have the proof right here of the satanic involvement, even more besides the imagery that we've already seen. We have Professor Edward Lee. And, you know, these guys are well versed in their history, I can assure you. And you've got to wonder why a group that is noted here, this is a return path email log from very reputable professors, professors and senior members of the defense and intelligence community. This is very important. This is not just a regular return path email. This is something that I BCI'd off the internet that they did not want anyone to see. And we have made it public for everyone to see. And nobody, I don't care who you are, um, hasn't come with this. Shadow dot DARPA dot mil and we are literally talking about the shadow government at this point and their insidious satanic involvement with child trafficking and so on which arrests have already been made and you see the beginning of this system begin 666 complex systems prop 1 then this encryption begins and you have all these different things and this actually was generated out of a place called Corey Hall okay very important for what's to come because what happens Okay, um, we get into the, um, the use of the Manitz network, which is a mobile ad hoc network. It's the use of different frequency, and it's a trunking radio. The most important thing about this, you do see the color coding, and this is the Manitz. Um, you do see the power of consciousness being equated into an official government document for use with resonant frequency expenditure, which is exactly what we're talking about here. And so... I hope that makes sense in that investigate importance of power expended on routing in these mobile ad hoc networks. The focus of this task is to look at the benefits of power consciousness in making routing decisions at the network layer. Now, we, it's so blatantly in your face, it's, it's difficult to follow if you don't speak these languages, but it gets on into the basic foundation of what the internet is all about. We go back to 1960, we saw the, uh, the, uh, the off-planet signal come in. We have the, the internet is already online, January 1st, 1960. What does the internet really mean? Does it have any scriptural um, mirroring? Has this been written about? Is there anything going on here that we can draw from, from the past which may be able to give us insight into our current situation now? Um, you do have the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which certainly is something that um, John of Patmos knew when he was writing the book of Revelation. Um, it was a common dialect that he would have known in his area as well as Greek. And that's just the history of it for you. Um, Va, or the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, in fact, is W. And so therefore, WWW has a numeric value of 666. This is not conjecture. This isn't a conspiracy theory. This is something that's going on. Of course, it's fundamental to the ARPANET and all the things that are a direct result from this off-planet contact that came onto this Earth. Okay, very interesting. Hmm, where are we going with this? We do see the 666 also noted down here, not only in the documents of, you know, reputable professors and senior defense officials involved in child trafficking, you see it in the Bible. We talk about the beast, and it talks about the image of the beast, which is a holographic manifestation which I'm trying to relate through the use of the pineal function located in the forehead um, and into our reality and using this. And so, you know, you have the name, the number, and the image of the beast led lit. No man might buy, sell, buy or sell say that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And it talks about the image up here. So you have the name, the number, and the image of the beast in Revelation. And this takes us to pineal functioning. It says that there's a projector in your head. You know, if we've ever had a lucid dream, if we've ever had a real experience where we're flying or any of these things, a real simple way to think about that is we're in another dimension. You can certainly express it in those terms. It's something that is tangible for us. We can feel it. We have emotion. We can wake up in all a variety of these different states. This is the essence of pineal function. 
You do have DMT in there. It's piezochromic. It's piezoelectric, as are many of the different things associated with Morgellons. And what we see is, is a mimicking of the natural inherent human ability um, by artificial intelligence seeking to take over the human ability for its own ends. You can't. It's hard to reckon why this is going on, but. A good way to understand that pineal function is tangible for somebody is just the art of dreaming and the, and the fact that we do that. Um, and we do then get into the ancient representations of the pineal gland and see that this has been well known for a long time. A lot of people won't realize that the eye of Ra that so many of them are familiar with from Egyptian mythology is actually the hypothalamus area of the brain here and the pineal gland. Okay? This is your pineal gland. This is your hypothalamus. Your pineal gland, this is the eye of Ra. You have the different symbology with the winged creatures and so on. I won't get into that too much because there's so much more to draw from. And we look at this. Okay. What do we have here? We have the Pope. He's got a pine cone here. We've got the court of the pine cone. Um, we have these beings here that, you know, look reptilian or bird-like. And, and, and this is in solid rock holding a pineal gland. We do have a Caucasian figure with a beard here holding a pineal gland. Here we kind of have a representation of the pineal gland itself kind of doing its thing. This is obviously a pineal gland. Of course, the pineal gland is called such because it looks like a pine cone or a pineapple. Um, we have it here in the brain. And of course, perception being such a large part of our reality, this is something that's known. A lot of people don't realize that if you were laying on your back or if you were simply looking up into the dome of the uh, capital, of the U.S. Capitol, there is what's called the apotheosis of George Washington there, which literally depicts George Washington becoming a god. And this is what this is all about. You have the 13 steps of the pyramid here. And this is a representation of your pineal gland. And if we let them use fear with this on our money and in the system, we have to break that intention. Of course, that's a real brain. The pineal gland is, is a stargate and so on. Um, and even Jesus himself said this, in that if your eye be single, then my whole body will be full of light. Um, and, and all the way back to Psalms, it says, you know, lift up ye heads, O ye glorious gates. To the everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, to the everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. I mean, it's such a, you know, the, the secrets are right here in front of us. And so, what is this? Time Warner. This is Time Warner, who's largely involved in fiber optic communications, television, and so on. And they are essentially actively telling us. They're, they're being very blatant and specific when they say that we're using fiber optic technology to interact with your pineal functioning. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and that's what this is about. Um, and we go on to the internet and how this all works, which of course is fiber optics is what allows the internet to work. It's a state of objective from DARPA and these other agencies that the sole conduit for basically all communication in the future is going to be Fiber optics, this is the state of objective anyway, and it says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now, in the different works that we have in the translation of the Bible, rather, some of these will say that glows of fire, the sea of glass that glows of fire, and then it says that he, he saw them that had gotten victory over the name, the number, and the image of the beast, and, and over the mark and the number of his name. And they stand there with the harps of God. Now, the sea of glass that's mingled with fire, or glows of fire, is what you're looking at right here is a glass spun tube, fiber optics, it all goes back to the www, the 666, the entire system is dependent upon this technology and it is acknowledged in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 15, okay? And so this is something that is amazing to me and breathtaking and, and, and something of topic of debate. I have, you know, talked with people about this. Uh, I'll go ahead and say Steve Quayle. Initially, when I realized this and understanding the technology, I contacted him. He had his own set of ideas about this, and I believe that he's largely come to change his mind. I don't want to speak for Steve, but certainly he's somebody that I respect, um, having written 12 books and, and, you know, really been a, a source of a lot of good information for people. Um, and this has been a bit of topic of debate. I have been in contact with some very high-level people about this, and the consensus is reaching the same thing. And to me personally, I don't feel like it's a matter of opinion. I think that it's a very clear reference to fiber optic technology in the context of which it was written with the WWW and so on, and the effect of this worshiping the image of the beast, which is the basis of this entire Montauk project. 
So, that takes us into the mold eye stuff, which is very specific. I would like to make note of uh, a friend of ours that we have worked with, um, Richard Sargoza, was unable to attend um, due to his type of specific targeting that this outlines in descriptive tale. This is a phenomenon that we had discussed initially in an interview in a conference call that we recorded with him, having he had done work with NASA and DARPA and others revolving around radio frequency. He was hesitant to share this stuff with us, but this is coded, obviously, but it's the office is interested in receiving proposals for innovative research, the development and demonstration of novel hybrid bio or biotic and abiotic nanoscale interface technologies that enable direct real-time conversion of biomolecular signals into electrical signals. Biological systems exhibit remarkable sensitivity, selectivity, and efficiency could be exploited in engineering systems should appropriate interfaces become available. Okay, that right there is the biggest human rights violation that we have ever heard of. It's an abomination in my opinion, and this has been going on with the integrated sensor network through the use of Morgellons and other types of things. And are there positive applications for this technology? Yes. Um, is it something that is still a human right if the human doesn't know? Absolutely it is. I am a proponent of me making the public aware of these types of technologies. But when you have a defense threat, the rationale behind some of this has been if you have a defense threat like bioweapons, chemical weapons, and so on, which we've seen with Ebola, which we've seen with the other stuff, they've come out and told us they have a cure for Ebola, didn't they? They sensed it right away when it came out, and you've got the president out there hugging and kissing somebody that had Ebola. What does that tell you? There's not going to be a rebola because it's over. Okay? And so that, that's a pretty big deal. And, and this is a big deal when we're talking about the real time conversion of a bioelectrical signals or biological signals into digital signals. Okay? Um, and you can just kind of read that for yourself. This talks about you know, permeating the transmembrane uh, of proteins, your DNA, cellular signal, signal processing, all run through an artificial intelligence monitoring the levels of disease and other things in the human body in real time on a massive scale. This was done in conjunction with um, Microsoft and others. And this is an official DARPA solicitation um, in use. It's saved in an old Microsoft format and these guys left it out here because they knew that this is something serious. And it's a, it's a, it's a blessing that this has leaked out um, into the public and I'm happy to do that um, because this is the brunt of how this technology works. Biologic, biology, biology to digital converter systems that enable direct real-time conversion of biological signals into digital information. Ongoing research in nanotechnology starting to demonstrate controlled fabrication of high-quality nanostructures. This is it. This is the thing that they're doing with the micro dots, the quantum dots, the fibers, and all the other stuff that everybody has experienced. And they can do it in real time. And bioencoding is a genetic specific technology to the point to where um, outfitted, um, you know, whatever the source may be, whether it's a drone or the, 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 the towers themselves or even something in the home, your microwave or so on, it can target you. Now they do it through your devices. They do it through our cell phones. They do it through our tablets. They do Wi-Fi with this. It's genetic specific to the point to where there could be a crowd of a billion people out there and they can hit one person and nobody else will feel it. You're talking about an array of different types of, uh, of symptomology that can be essentially pushed onto somebody unknowingly, unwittingly to torture them, to hurt them. Now, again, there are positive applications for this, but this type of technology in the wrong hands is something that is such, just a, it's an abomination, it's such a violation of human rights. I and mean, you're talking about stealing your cellular function. Okay? I mean, that's a big deal. And so this takes us into the nest aspect, which is something that puzzles me, fascinates me. How is this really happening? Why has this been so compartmentalized? Just, oh my goodness, we have self-assembling holographic biosensors and biocomputers. This is from Sandia, one of the premier laboratories in the world with limited release, uh, a release from 2006. It says, we present concepts for self-assembly of diffractive optics with potential uses in biosensors and biocomputers. 
The simplest such optics, the fraction gratings, can potentially be made from chemically stabilized microtubules migrating on micro-patterned tracks of motor protein kinesin. And we do see this reflected in the Morgellons <laughs> epidemic without question. Okay, this is the root of these different fibers, the stuff that people, you know, biomolecular interfaces and systems. Okay, how does this come out and how does this fit in? It's very fascinating. It takes us into the bio-nano interface. This is from Lieber's. Lieber's is uh, implicated in the other um, stuff from Berkeley that we had gone over earlier. And this is, this is it. This is interfacing with your devices on a nano level with electromagnetic frequency for uh, so many different things. Um, the applications are really such a, there's such a, it's a virtual cornucopia of different uh, application. And so we can judge for ourselves this is good or bad. Now, we're going to be facing this in, in, in the years and months and, and, you know, in the future period of how we're going to deal with this and allocate a set of different laws and stuff in which will, you know, regulate the use of this type of technology because it's not going anywhere. It's self-replicating. Um, and this is a big deal. You know, this is, you know, this has been going on. And so this, you can see that this is from Sandia. Anybody can look this up and look into this themselves. Our tax dollars have literally helped pay for this. And this is a schematic here of a kinked nanowire. This is from Harvard. And Nanowires with a core shell geometry can be tailored to have diverse electrical and optical properties. Shown here in a false color sim image of a modulation dubbed core shell nanowire, which has been designed to function as a standalone nanoscale solar cell. What does that tell us? That it collects solar energy and enables us to move through the body. Based on that, in the body, come out of you. How many times have I heard these guys talk about, oh yeah, we've got fibers coming through our skin. What does this picture show us? This is going into a cell. Okay? So yeah, this stuff is real. We know that this is not a joke. This is not a game. And so this does give a strong sense of validity to the Morgellons epidemic um, in which, of course, this is something that we can overcome with the use of resonant frequency also. And so um, we get into the neural dust. It's going to take us into how this whole thing has functioned. This is very important. I'm trying to wind this down for us. We've all had a long weekend. And this is obviously heavy subject matter, but the neural dust, uh, an ultrasonic low power solution for chronic brain machine interfaces. We have your skull, you have the blood vein, brain barrier, you get down into the cortex here, you see the placement of these into the brain below the blood brain barrier. Okay? Um, we know that the nanoscale does this. Um, and a major hurdle in brain machine interface technology, or BMI, is the lack of an implantable neural interface system that remains viable for a substantial fraction of a primate lifetime. So they're putting this in the context of primates right now. Um, again, if you know your stuff in defense and intelligence, you know that this stuff is you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years behind what's already been mil uh, implemented for military applications. Uh, well, I can't, you know, we can get into that at a later date, but you know, what more do you need? You have the Department of Defense official website here. Okay, Department of Defense. This is a HTML link that anybody can look up for themselves. Armed with Science, the official U.S. Defense Department science blog. Armed with Science, okay? What does it say? It says remote control of brain activity using ultrasound. Is this something that we want out there? What have we been talking about the whole time? This is the real deal. This is from September of 2010. And every single aspect of human sensation, perception, emotion, and behavior is regulated by brain activity, thus having the ability to stimulate brain function is a powerful technology. I would say so, and to the point that you can control basically the whole planet with, with a small system running off artificial intelligence, and God forbid you be the person putting the parameters in there. It's going to try to take you over, or whatever is going on here. Um, it's certainly something that needs to be addressed, and again, it's very interesting that we do see the Bilderberg Group meeting right now um, about artificial intelligence. I'm here to tell you that that is because they have figured out that it has been in control. Um, this is a very interesting chronology in and of itself. This is the day before Kim's birthday back in 2013 in which the system, if we'll remember, the 666 system from Berkeley was propagated out of a place called Corey Hall. Okay? This happens to be Corey Hall. 
Okay? This is the day before the government shutdown. This was actually published on October 1st, 2013. That was the first day of the government shutdown in 2013. Hours before the government shut down. Literally hours. We had a human chipping agenda and planted into this Obamacare, excuse the pun, and we shut down the whole thing because the House and the Congress wouldn't push it through. The House didn't want to do it. Senate and the House didn't want to do it. Senate and Congress, rather. And hours before the government shut down, the Satanic System propagation site blows up. The entire campus of Berkeley is evacuated. Major big deal. Okay? What happens next? Hours later, the government shuts down. Literally. Literally, the government shuts down hours later. We saw the 666 system, 666 system, it comes out of there, it's gone. Now the government shuts down, what's next? One week later, one week later, the NSA data center melts down and it delayed the opening more than a year, according to reports, okay? This is the system out in Berkeley. That chronology in and of itself, this here dated October 8th of 2013, literally, we have a week span of the system, okay, going up in flames. <laughs> Standing up. Okay? It's beautiful. Okay, this is the NSA spying system that was spying on our brains. Then this thing melts down. Okay? Wow. Um, and so I guess that's the end of where we'll be right now. I guess that's all we got there. Um, I would just like to say that there's much more to come for this. We, we put this together, Bobby Bond and I, last night. I really owe this presentation to his help of helping me land this out. With everybody's help here, it's been amazing. But I'm not opposed to taking any comments. Does anybody have any questions or anything that I can help answer while we're still rolling here? Does that make sense to you guys? Does this mean anything to you? I mean, how do you feel about what you've just witnessed here? I think the most important thing for all of us is to know that we know where we're going, and that is we have victory over this system. Absolutely. Solutions oriented. Yes. What do you I think, think that is? I think the most important part to remember is that the way we will dismantle this system is through our human intention, through the purity of our hearts, through the notion of knowing and doing the right thing that we feel in our hearts that something is very wrong on our planet. Everybody knows something is very wrong. Nobody can pinpoint it. Nobody can figure out exactly what they're sensing and what they're feeling because there's a very unnatural force trying to take over the world and everything on it, including us. So I think it's imperative to remember that the way all of this is going to happen is through the human collective consciousness, raising the vibration of that consciousness, and by living life in the purest way and doing the right thing, basically. So again, we go back to human intention, which has the power to do anything we choose to use it for, good or bad. Absolutely. You know, um, being born into secret projects, my dad spoke five languages and all this kind of stuff. The one word that wasn't in his vocabulary was can't. It's one of the things they instilled in me. Can you tell us a little bit? Do you care if I put you on camera real quick? Do you not want to? Huh? You don't care? I just want to ask you about when you, during the first part of the presentation, if you remember what happened, if you just want to kind of tell us what that looked like and, and what it meant to you and how that happened, because it's something that really concerned me and it scared me. I'll be honest with you, it scared me. And so what was that for you? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, you'd put a picture of a spacecraft. Uh, that I've actually seen in person and it's the um, oh man I've been through some shit but that's the scary shit I've ever, I've ever been through in my life you know what I'm saying and, and um, it just obviously triggered uh, just triggered a memory and went into a seizure they say can you tell us about the clearings and how it's helped you I'm here. I'm here. If it wasn't for the clearance, I wouldn't be here. I mean, from somebody who had basically been bedridden, right? Yeah, I literally. mean, we've talked to every, I've, I mean, I've, this is the change that you've had in the last, you know, two days has been amazing. And so, it I guess is. we'll cut it there. I just wanted to touch on that, guys. I appreciate all you guys being here.
Um, 